when the spiritual outlook of life assumes a practical shape it becomes religion in one's great day life the conducting of one's personality in its entirety in the light of this vision which is spirituality is religious practice we have to bear in mind that religion is the life that we live and it is just that all conduct in life is a manifestation of a vision that we have in our entire arrangement with the total atmosphere a knowledge of what we are actually seeking is at the back of what we have to do in life in as much as all activity in life is an endeavor towards the fulfillment of the basic aspirations of our total personality and also because of the fact that all aspiration is in the end spiritual life in its very performances also becomes spiritual all work everything that we do our professions and our undertakings are various ramifications of the central aspiration to achieve the direct experience of the spiritual constitution of existence we are likely to miss the point that the life that we live in this world is a complete encounter with the world as a whole and never in any of our undertakings or works are we fractionally connected with anything in the world the world is a whole in itself and we to our whole in our own self thus the way in which we come in contact with the world is also a whole in its operation but the way in which we think usually due to the desires which are personal prevents this placement of the entirety of our personality in its real encounter with the whole world we belong to the whole world in this sense it is not that we belong to any little segment of existence there are no fractions anywhere in creation 
Even the minute organisms are not fractions. The littlest atom is a whole in itself. Our expectations in life are not fragmentary. We, require, we do not ask for a little of something. We expect the whole of anything. That we are unable to achieve this purpose. That nothing in a wholesome manner comes to us. We seem to be getting little of small things is the outcome of a distracted approach of ours in respect of the constituents of the world. To be a religious person is not an easy job because if religion is the way of living, it is a process of the transmutation of oneself as required in the light of one's placement in the structure of the world. If this is religion, any activity that would not touch the core of ourselves would be a kind of movement taking place on the surface of our being, touching not our own self, and any work, any activity that proceeds not from our own selves but from the surface of our being, will not bring satisfaction to our being. We will get nothing out of this work, inasmuch as our work does not manifest from our own self. A deed is supposed to be a manifestation of one's intentions. The intention is not merely a makeshift. It is not a political adjustment or a maneuver. It is a rising to the occasion of the whole thing that we are. All spirituality is wholesome in its nature. To repeat once again what we have been considering earlier, some days back, spirituality is the nature of the spirit and the spirit is the essence of anything and everything. Inasmuch as there is an essence, a core in all things, there is also a spiritual longing in everything. Basically, all asking is a spiritual asking. But because this call of the spirit, this expectation of the soul passes through the medium of the sense organs, the mind, intellect and even the physical relation, it gets diversified and diluted into the form of external contacts and it loses the vitality with which it rose. It also gets divested of its very intention, the purpose for which we undertake to do anything in the world gets lost in the diversified form through which this intention of ours reveals itself outwardly. Our longings are not an outward movement. Our desires are not actually a physical activity. It is not merely the skin of the body that is asking for final freedom and satisfaction. We have a deeper core which remains in a state of dissatisfaction due to which it asks for that alone which can free it from this eternal longing, the cause of its 
dissatisfaction. Many a time we find it difficult to extricate the inner content of our basic longing or aspiration from the external forms it takes when it passes through the shells of the personality, the forms of our individuality, or the sheaths of the body, as we say, the anumaya, etc., as the light of the sun may appear to assume different colors and project itself through various rays in convex and concave forms or in distorted shapes, so does this real asking of ourselves inwardly, which is wholly spiritual, appears to be a physical asking, a social requirement, an outward comfort that we actually seem to be wanting. The outwardness in which our basic longing gets involved is the difficulty that we are facing in our life. Nothing in us is really outward. We are ourselves. We do not become something external to our own selves at any time. Therefore, anything that emanates from us also cannot be an external action. No action can be really called external. The great teaching of the Bhagavad Gita is just this much, that work is not an externalized performance. It is only when we are able to envisage the non-externality of our performance we call work, that it becomes a divine worship. The divinity in our daily performances arises on account of the divinity that is at the back of our aspirations. Basically we are divine in our essence. The soul is the symbol of divinity in us. Its longing is the true longing. What it asks for is only what anyone wants. Its aspiration is called spiritual longing, the search for truth. And therefore, it cannot be an outward, time-conditioned performance. But it appears as if we are conditioned by time process. The body is in the midst of the movement of time, divided into past, present and future. The body is in a space which is three-dimensional. Because this is so. And because we mistake our body for what we really are, we condition our spiritual longing by the pressures of the dimensions of space and the segmentations of time. Not only that, our longings appear to be physical rather than spiritual. Do we not ask for physical comfort, though it is sure Everyone knows very well that physical comforts are not just the things that we need in the world. Yet we crave for physical satisfaction only. All the longings of ours in our daily life's activity is just a call for physical comforts. Even what we expect from human society and the administrative setup of the government is physical. It is very unfortunate that we seem to be wanting only physical satisfaction, security which is physical in its nature, protection against the annihilation of our physical existence, freedom from the fear of death of the physical body, we seem to be asking only this much, while this is not actually the intention of the soul. Our soul is not placed in space, it is not in time, it is not inside the body, it is a very widespread operation taking place everywhere at all times, in every nook and corner of creation. Spirituality is a universal operation. A spiritual seeking is not one man's work. It is not 
something that was someone does somewhere independently unrelated to other factors that conditions life in the world spiritual asking spiritual seeking spiritual living the religious conduct of existence is not a personal affair it is not personal because spirituality is not limited to the physical personality of anyone as i mentioned we appear to be personally conditioned even in our religious practices and it looks as if someone is independently doing some spiritual practice somewhere because of a travesty of affairs that has taken place because our inner spiritual longing passes through the lens of the coverings of the soul the bodily engagement in as much as it is so it is assuming a form which is psychological sometimes physical at other times very unfortunate that unending joy that we expect from an eternal quest that is emanating from ourselves has taken the form of a psychological security by means of name fame power authority and a physical security by way of all available comforts and outward protection the universal longing which emanates from the universal center which is our soul apparently assumes the form of the human desires and the social requirements of the personality which predicament we should free ourselves from with great effort of our will intense reasoning along these lines and a devotee of sufficient time in our daily life for this kind of meditation it is first of all essential for us to be convinced that we are more than what we appear to be we always go satisfied with a feeling that we take for granted that we are sons and daughters of people socially connected with other persons there is nothing more in us and we are human to the core we are nothing more nothing less if we are only individuals units in human society and we are no more than that our desires should be capable of fulfillment instantaneously by a human adjustment of values and a social adaptation of our life but any kind of adjustment and such adaptation does not give us freedom finally we know there is the icy hand of death that strikes on the head of everyone one day or other in spite of any kind of adjustment that we make and all the protection that we expect psychologically or physically there is a rule and a law evidently that defies the arguments of the physical body and human society that law tells you that you shall be wrenched from this involvement which is physical and social 
by the operation of factors which are neither physical nor social. The asking for God is supposed to be the occupation of a religious person. Religion is spirituality in practice. In as much as the spiritual vision of things, as we have noticed already, is a universal vision of all things. It cannot be anything else. The religious undertaking in our daily life also is a practice that is super individualistic. It is not even a social performance. It is not a creed to which we belong. It follows from this analysis that religion is not a character of a community. It is not conditioned by anything that we can associate with factors geographical, ethnic, linguistic, etc. It is a common requirement of anything that is alive, anything that is really human. All mankind basically has one longing only to survive and to survive at the highest possible reach of achievement. But it appears, it appears that the forms of religion are multifold. There is no universal religion available in the world. This again is due to the fact that the otherwise universal upsurge of the human soul which is the basic religious asking gets conditioned by geographical factors, historical conditions and ethnic relations. All this merely highlights that we cannot easily get over the limitations of the physical body and our sense of belonging to a particular group of people called society, the idea of a nation or a country, sometimes going even first far deep below into smaller circles of limitation, thus converting the so-called religion of ours into a fanatic creed of a particular community or perhaps even a little family. This difficulty in first of all an envisaging the true meaning of a spiritual vision <coughs> and the difficulty in living a religious life, this difficulty is the reason why we have been told again and again that a special disciplinary process has to be undergone by every seeking soul under a competent master, a religious university. He is called for, evidently, for the training of religious seeking, which has to be carefully guarded from its spontaneous and automatic involvements in conditions which are other than spiritual and religious. A godly aspiration can get involved in ungodly conditions, which mostly happens as we see through the passage of the history of religions in the world. A disciplined approach to the fulfillment of our spiritual longing is known usually as the practice of yoga. Nowadays, the word yoga has become 
so very familiar in the countries of the world that it does not require much of an introduction. Everyone is a yoga student or a yoga teacher from one's own vision of what the yoga is, but in order that yoga may yield its desired fruits, it has to become the true implementation of the real religion which we are expected to live as a manifestation of a totally spiritual vision of life. We are told that yoga is a kind of union, a unitedness of ourselves with something in all the levels of our being and in all our relationships with people. We have different kinds of yogas with which you are all familiar. These definitions of yoga relate to the many-sided approach that is possible in the practice of this discipline in the light of the temperaments of people varying one from the other, conditions of life differing in different ways. Nevertheless, in spite of these differences that we concede on account of varying temperaments, basically yoga is an onward march of the deepest roots of what we are, whatever we are, but this march being a systematic process of the expansion on one side and ascent on the other side. It has a width as well as a height. In our daily routines of yoga, on the one hand we become wider personalities, more than what we physically and individually are. That means to say, we become more considerate in our relationship with people, we become loving in our conduct, we become appreciative of the circumstances in which other people are placed, we are cooperative and sympathetic with others, we harm not any living being, we deceive not anyone in society, we grab not anyone's property, we hold not wealth more than what we require for our basic existence and we live a life of utter truthfulness. This is how we can expand our personality into a cooperative existence so that society, not merely of human beings but even of all beings, gets transformed into a framework of association and cooperation with us. The world is at our back in a relationship of friendliness and sympathy and affection, the world shall love us. We become sarva bhuta hide rataha in the language of the Bhagavad Gita. This is how we expand the dimension of our personality socially, horizontally as it were. The yamas and the niyamas mentioned in the yoga system are this much, a consideration on our part in relation to the world in which we live, so that we do not live as strangers in our own world, but become citizens 
of this universe. But there is also at the same time an ascending factor in the practice of yoga other than the expansion of a horizontal dimension by way of social cooperation and external consideration of values. This ascending aspect of the practice of yoga is the higher side of it. It is also said that yoga involves a twofold practice known as vairagya and abhyasa. <coughs> Maybe from one point of view at least we may say this horizontal dimension of ours expanding beyond the limitations of the physical body is a kind of practice involving detachment and freedom from attachment but for which our affection for the things of the world, our cooperation with things would be impossible. Vairagya is this much and Abhyasa is the direct inward practice of our soul's location in the direction of its movement upwards. Yoga is an upward ascent from involvement in physical matter and conditions which are outward in the direction of whatever is above it, whatever is beneath it. We look upon ourselves as the physical body only. We have little time to think that we are anything other than this body. Conceding that the involvement of our mind in the body is a fact of life, to that extent we have to be sympathetic enough, sympathetic enough to take the body also into confidence and convert the body itself into an instrument of higher essence. It is not true that the body is something to be always rejected as something redundant. Nothing can be called unnecessary when we get mentally or intellectually or in our conscious life get involved in it. Even an utter illusion can become a reality in so far as we are involved in it. It is no more an illusion. To the extent we are involved in that illusion, our mind is in it, our consciousness has enveloped it. To that extent, even utter unrealities are realities only. Do not illusions satisfy us in life? They do so because of our involvement wholly by the entry of our consciousness into the structure of that illusion. So do not say that the body is an illusion, it is an ass that is to be struck down, it is no more that as the body has somehow managed to insinuate itself into our own feeling that it is we, it has to be utilized and not rejected in the practice of yoga. This healthy, cooperative, sympathetic, intelligent transmutation of our physical association with his body into a practice of yoga actually is what is known as Hatha Yoga. The asanas, the postures and the various disciplines of the muscles and the nerves are physical no doubt, but they are disciplines of such a nature that they stabilize the muscles and the nerves and the biological functions in such a way that the chaotic involvement of our psyche in the physical body through the pranas causing distress to us every day will be properly aligned 
along required lines and he assume a health which is not only of the muscles and the nerves but also of the vitality of us we are sick people though we may not be always lying in bed in a hospital our ailment is not always a medical sickness but it is some kind of discomfort that we always feel in our own selves caused by a peculiar wrong adjustment between our thought and the body and our not being aware that we have some inner mechanism operating inside the body we are just the body only and we do not even know that we have a mind sometimes as we are fully occupied in physical relations and physical activities the essence in yoga is also an inwardness that we establish in our own selves actually the essence is an inwardized essence the essence is not actually to be construed in spatial terms as a kind of rising from one rung of ladder to another rung of a ladder the type of ladder which masons or workers use in the construction of a house that is not the kind of ladder which we are using in our ascent through yoga it is an ascent of ourselves through our own selves the ladder is not outside us we ourselves become ladders at present we are in the lowest rung of the ladder we say the mind is lodged in the muladhara chakra which is to say that we are wholly involved in the physical world we are entirely sunk in physical relations our desires are entirely material and physical our frustrations are caused by the inability of the mind to secure enough physical satisfaction and material comfort our instincts are basically animalistic if we are in the lowest rung of the ladder which is the entire satisfaction that the senses feel in their contact with physical objects we are at the lowest level of life if we are unable to find any joy in life which is not sensory which is not physically con- construed which is not material in nature to the extent we require material objects for our comfort to that extent we are far far removed from the spiritual requirement the physical exercises known as the asana constitute therefore a necessary discipline to stabilize the operations of the body in order to facilitate the permeating of the vital energy in us through the pores on the cells of the body making us healthy first physically and then poised in our mind as a consequence the practice of yoga is a movement towards health of personality and also in the direction of the establishment of a healthy relationship with people the mentioned achievement by way of an expansion of our dimension through social coordination also is not an easy affair we generally take to yoga asanas pranayama concentration and such practices under the impression that we are wholly prepared for such exercises 
it is not always true because our relations outwardly our visioning of things our opinions in respect of the things of the world are not always as they ought to be the love and the hatred that mostly condition our social life and personal relations will tell us how far we are from the requirement even initial in the practice of yoga we have to emphasize again what the yoga calls yamas and they are not so very unimportant and just ethical instructions as we consider them consider them to be the yamas are not a requirement of ethics and morality it is a direct requirement in our daily life in our day to day relationships the yamas you know very well what these are in the language of the yoga are not instructions given to us to be good it is not a teaching that we should be moral and ethical in our behavior because of the fact that it is told us again and again that it is good to be good it is proper to be ethical and it is necessary to be moral it is not an injunction that we are following it is a necessary recipe that we have to adopt in the free realm that we have to achieve from every kind of illness that is social and relational we are good we are moral and ethical not because it is good to be so in the light of the social requirements but it is essential for the maintenance of our health because any kind of anti ethical movement emanating from our internal nature would not merely be an anti social attitude it also would be anti healthy because anything that is anti in the outer sense is also anti in the inner sense merely because the relationship that we have with the world is neither inward entirely nor outward entirely it is a wholesome action taking place vitally between ourselves and the world hence one need not be too very enthusiastic in devoting all one's time only for hatha yoga or even pranayama not knowing where one stands in one's outward relations in one's opinions in one's philosophies and in one's likes and dislikes the touchstone of our personality is the attitude that we put on when we are opposed in life the strength of a person as well as the essential character of a person gets revealed during periods of intense opposition from outside otherwise these natures are buried and we cannot know exactly what we are though we do not expect actual opposition from nature or society we can intelligently rationally spontaneously place ourselves in an atmosphere of this cooperation that we establish with all things which is an opposition that we instill into our own selves deliberately opposition to our own instinctive nature because if this test is not injected into our own personality we will be put to this test one day or other by the compulsions of nature and the demands of the higher reaches of yoga very cautious one has to be in treading these levels of yoga and his always makes waste as they say there is no need to be quick and anxious in the steps that we take in the direction of yoga practice because we will find 
as we rise higher and higher in the ascending series, we will find the practice is more and more difficult. The intensity of the difficulty that we may feel in the higher ascents arises because of shaky foundations that we have laid earlier. The structure cannot rise on a foundation that has not been well laid. We cannot lay this foundation our own selves. Inasmuch as we do not know what is ahead of us, the secrets of nature are always hidden from our eyes. A guru is essential. We have to be humble students under a competent master. The study under a teacher is a vital communication that we establish with a higher response that comes from a nature that is above us. The guru or a teacher or a master is not just an individual like you, another person, but a super person that is the object of your adoration. A master or a guru or a teacher, he is not a person like you. Because if you consider the guru as another person like you, naturally there will be an inclination sometimes to change the person and become a student of some other guru, which is not possible if you understand what a guru actually means. A guru is a spiritual entity, a manifestation of a higher dimension of realization, including the dimension in which you are occupying, super social, super individual, and therefore more capable of an inclusiveness that you are incapable of. In these days, of course, we know very well that it is difficult to find a competent teacher, yet we may say the world is not so bad as to make it impossible for us to find a good teacher. There is some virtue still prevailing. The world is not all devil yet. There is some sort of goodness, dharma. God is still alive. It appears to be that. And there is a hope for everyone. It is therefore necessary for each one of us to be gradually moving upwards, cautiously taking our steps one over the other and finding enough time to be alone to our own selves for this purpose and not too much get engrossed in unnecessary activities of life. In your daily program, make a distinction between most essentials which you cannot avoid and non-essentials which you may avoid. It is not that everything that we do from morning to evening is all very, very essential. Sometimes we like to be a little light-hearted, free, in a sense of abandon of our physical and social nature uh, on which we can put a sort of restriction gradually which is not very difficult. It is necessary to feel a kind of greater satisfaction in oneself when one is alone than one is in the midst of people. We feel miserable when we are alone mostly, we feel wretched. You would like to go to the shop or go somewhere and have a handshake with someone or go to a tea shop, say something to someone and have a gappa or a gap because it is difficult to be alone to answer. The social nature has entered us in such a morbid way, we may say, that we have ceased to be what we are in ourselves, but to be a spiritual seeker, to be a healthy person, is to also realize that it is not necessary for us to be dependent on external factors always. There is a potentiality in us. We are healthy, we can be healthy in our own selves without borrowing things from outside. It is essential one day or other to be alone in our own self. Alone you have come and alone you will go. You must remember this and therefore it will be necessary for you to realize even today in social life, in this family life and community life, you are really alone. Your friends are not real friends. It is good to be a little bit wise in our life in this world and not actually be expecting a kick from nature when we will be forced to be alone in our own selves. Find a little time to be alone to yourself and be free to place yourself before this great majesty of God's creation. You are face to face in the early morning when you wake up from sleep, not with people, but with creation. 
What you see in front of you is God's creation. It is not your house that you see in the early morning. It is not your kitchen. It is not your family members. It is not your study. It is not your office. It is creation that you are envisaging. Is it not possible to widen our vision a little bit? It is so easy if only we can be a little bit investigative and capable of going deep into the implications of our daily perception. Again, to repeat, all this is difficult for an individual seeker without the help and guide from a competent master. We had in our own life the blessing of being under the umbrella and protection of a great sage, Swami Shivananji Maharaj. Physically he is not visible, but invisibly he is operating even now. And even if you cannot find a teacher due to difficulties of our own personal your lives, you can be sure that this great master Swami Shivananji Maharaj will act as your guide even now, though he is not visible to the eyes. If your soul is actually aspiring, if your heart is sincere, and if you truly wish to be spiritual and be on the path of the quest of reality, sages and masters of the higher realms will descend for your protection. Nobody is dead in this world. Neither Swami Shivananji is dead nor anybody is dead. They are all placed in some realm. A higher potentiality of existence from where they can operate in a greater and more powerful way than they could do through their physical bodies. Then God Himself can come to you for your help. Why not others who are God men? The world is not remote. It is not entirely outside. It is involved in everything that we are. And our sincerity will summon and is capable of evoking the blessing of all the saints and sages, visible or invisible, great adepts who live in higher realms will descend and bless us. Whether we are aware of the way in which this blessing comes or not, because grace divine descends in its own way and it did not work always in the manner we expect it to work. God's incarnations are supposed to be perpetual and they take place from moment to moment whether or not we are able to recognize them. The entire wonder of God's creation, the way of nature and the history of humanity, the process of natural evolution is a perpetual incarnation that is taking place and a perennial demonstration of the fact that protection comes perpetually from every side and it is available to everyone at any moment, even just now, if only you really ask for that protection and grace from the bottom of your heart. Hari Om Tat Sat. Om Purnamada Purnamadam Purna Purnamada Tide Purna Siya Purnamadai Purnamiva Vishishti Om Vishanti Shanti 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 Shanti